This is the story of Mayhenair Flight 1095. On the 15th of October 2015, a Mayhenair 747 was flying from Merhabad International Airport to Bandar Abbas in Iran. Can I just say for a second that Iran's slowly becoming an aviation nerd's paradise? I mean, Iran has a lot of old airplanes that are flying nowhere else in the world. If you wanted to see an F-14 Tomcat in flight, that's the only place to do it. Also, they have a few MD-82s that are in flying conditions over there. I wish we had more of that elsewhere. Today, we are talking about a Mayhenair 747-400. The jumbo jet had 422 passengers and 19 crew members on board. It is rare that you see a jumbo jet on such a short domestic flight, but that's what's happening here. The captain had flown a multitude of Airbus and Boeing aircraft and had more than 24,000 hours of experience in the air. The first officer flew the Airbus A300 before the 747, and he had 3,800 hours of experience. The plane lined up with runway 29 left, and four engines of the 747 were pushed to max power for this takeoff. As the plane picked up speed, the 747 lifted off into the skies of Iran at 8.16 a.m. local time. The pilots put the jet into a left-hand bank as they pointed the plane in the direction of their destination. As they climbed, the pilots noticed something weird. The vibration data from engine number 3 made no sense whatsoever. All other engines had a vibration value of 0.4, but the number 3 engine was at 2.4. The pilots didn't make too much of it, and they opted to continue on with the flight. Flight 1095 slowly climbed over the suburbs of Tehran as it gained altitude, and then when they hit 7,500 feet, the jet was rocked by an explosion. The whole plane swayed as the pilots raced to figure out what was happening, and they tried their best to counteract what was happening. As they struggled with the plane, a multitude of warnings were going off in the cockpit. They noticed something that was very concerning. They had lost engine number 3, or the inboard engine, on the right-hand side. The 747 had four engines, so losing one isn't such a big deal. But in addition to that, they also had lost their 1, 3, and 4 hydraulic systems. Now, that was a massive deal. On large jets, the control surfaces of the plane aren't moved by the pilots directly, but their movements get translated into electrical commands that then get sent to the hydraulic motors, which then move the control surfaces. If you lose your hydraulic systems, you're going to have a barely controllable plane on your hands. So these pilots had to land this plane before the last hydraulic system gave out. They were in a race against time. They had just taken off, so the best course of action would be to turn back and land on the runway that they had just taken off from. Since the jet was fueled for such a short flight, they were not too overweight for the landing. One less thing to worry about is good, right? The vibrations made it clear that something was seriously wrong with this plane. The indicators told them that engine number 4 was also experiencing some trouble. If they lost another engine, then they'd be in a world of trouble. Then they lost engine number 4 as well. The pilots had a ton of checklists to do, from running the two-engine inoperative checklist to the two hydraulics inoperative checklist to the fuel leak procedure and a whole host of other ones. Then, after doing all of that, they'd be able to get the stricken plane back on the ground. As they headed back towards the airport, the pilots tried their best to restart engine number four, but engine number four did not start up again. Making matters worse, they were leaking fuel from some of the tanks on the right-hand side of the plane. They would have to land the plane like this. The captain put out a mayday, and the controller told them that they could land on runway 29 left if they still wanted. That's what they decided to do. They kept the plane in the left-hand bank that it was in. They tried to turn on the autopilot to take a bit of the load off of them, but since hydraulic line number one was shot, the autopilot refused to engage. They kept hand-flying the plane, and soon it was time to make a one final turn to line up with the runway. They had the runway in sight. They trimmed the plane to keep it lined up with the center line, and less than 45 minutes after they had taken off, they landed right back down at Tehran. They were all a bit shaken, but they had made it. Once on the ground, it was apparent how close they had come to disaster. Most of engine number three wasn't even attached to the airplane anymore. In fact, most of the engine was strewn across the suburbs of Tehran. For some unfathomable reason, engine number three had exploded 
while the plane was climbing, and it had taken out engine number four and the hydraulic systems on the 747. In fact, when they inspected engine number four, they found out that engine number four had ingested shrapnel from the rapidly deteriorating engine next to it. In the suburbs of Iran, in a livestock farm, they found the remains of what fell from engine number three. As they examined the wreckage, they found out that the rear low-pressure turbine in engine number three had failed. The failure of that one turbine then set off a chain reaction that ended up in the uncontained failure of the engine. When the turbine fractured, it sent pieces flying radially outward into the engine and its surroundings. As it turned out, the reason why this engine exploded was well understood. Since the year 2008, there had been multiple failures, eight to be precise, of this very nature. General Electric had studied the failures, and they had put out the fixes to these problems as airworthiness directives. Well, the root of the problem was a slight imbalance in the high-pressure turbine of the engine, which allowed for vibrations to build up in the engine, thus causing cracks to form in the low-pressure turbine section. This type of fatigue could be mitigated by borescope inspections, thermocouple inspections, ultrasonic inspections, and a general inspection of the discs themselves. These could be achieved by following the listed airworthiness directives. But the thing is, they found that the airline apparently did adhere to airworthiness directives. If the directives had been followed, then this action should not have taken place. Did General Electric miss something when they designed the airworthiness directives? To understand what, they looked at the turbine that failed to see what had happened over the years. Well, the disc had been installed on another engine when it was about 3,000 cycles into its lifespan. The engineers at Mayhener extended its life cycle to 12,600 cycles using a clause in one of the airworthiness directives. Then, in 2015, the disc was removed from the engine due to too much vibration. This happened a few times. Apparently, they put the disc in an engine and then hooked it up to an A300 to see if the vibrations were gone. But it wasn't. The engine still showed higher levels of vibration than other engines. So it was deemed unsafe to be put into an engine as per the airworthiness directives. But there was a critical communication mistake between the engine shop and the engineering department. The engine shop didn't really check what all airworthiness directives applied to the engine. Had they done that, they would have known that they should have replaced the disc, but they didn't. They also did not communicate this properly to the engineering department. Thus, the defective disc was put into an engine, and on the 9th of October 2015, that engine was put on the number 3 pylon on the accident 747. The turbine disc that should not have been on an airplane ended up on a 747 one with 422 people on board. But that should not have happened. Before the accident, multiple crews had reported higher than average vibrations on engine number three. In response to this, the engineers retorqued the spinners and they rebalanced the fan. But that only reduced the vibrations momentarily. But before long, the vibrations were back and they continued to build until they reached a crescendo on the 15th of October, 2015. Something to note is that Mayhan Air did not have access to Boeing for maintaining their 747s, at least not in the way that other carriers did. Due to the sanctions on Iran due to its nuclear weapons program, Boeing was prohibited from working with Mayhan Air. So Mayhan Air tried to keep their parts in service for as long as possible. Do you think that the sanctions had a small effect on this accident? Maybe if they had access to better parts, then maybe they would not have to stretch the lifespan of the parts that they already had. It is scary how close this came to disaster. They lost most of their hydraulics and they barely made it back to the airport in time. I'm surprised that this accident is not more widely covered considering how close they came to disaster. But the skilled pilots managed to land the plane, saving everyone on board. This plane was in the shop for a while after this incident. Many people thought that this plane would never fly again. But after six years, six years of maintenance in Iran, the 747 took to the skies again just last year. It's always nice to see more and more 747s get back into the air. But that brings up the question. Tons and tons of companies try to keep their planes in the air without the adequate amount of maintenance. Do they think that they will be the exception to the rule? Do they think that their planes will somehow magically stay in the air despite a lack of current maintenance? 
This reminds me of a video I did years ago where a plane in Pakistan was neglected and it ended up crashing for a very similar reason to this. You can find a link to that video on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.